I guess, a bit of a step through of the API. So anybody interested in building stuff on it, but also contributing uh, on the PHP side of things, then I thought it'd be good just to give a bit of a walkthrough of the code structure and everything. So, you know, maybe uh, help a little bit with just understanding the kind of macro level of how the plugin works and things like that. Um, so that's the basic idea here, really, is, is to run through that. Uh, so there's a couple of different uh, kind of flows we're going to go through. One is just like the life cycle of a HTTP request and how it goes through the plugin and how it gets rooted everywhere. And the other one is more around like the uh, endpoint abstraction and how that's built up. Uh, so as Ryan's in the room, then I'll let him correct me on anything I get egregiously wrong. But um, yeah. So uh, yeah, apologies for the projector line length and everything, but um, the best we've got. Uh, so WP API plugin, maybe I'll just quickly kind of uh, every, everybody on the same page. Uh, what we're running here is, oh, don't have internet. And I can't, I can't even select my internet thing. What is going on here? Uh, so like, I mean, I probably don't need it, but it's OK. What is that? <laughs> OK, no worries. We don't really need it. Uh, uh, it's OK. It's OK. Uh, so the project is at github.com slash WP hyphen API slash WP hyphen API. Uh, the develop branch is the version 2, which is pretty much what we're talking about today. All of the latest development effort is on version 2, so that's where we should be looking. Uh, it's the default branch, so I think if you just git clone, then that is the branch you get, as far as I know. Uh, when you run it locally, uh, one thing I discovered earlier is you should run against uh, WordPress trunk because there's a few patches we've got into version 4.3 that the API relies on. So uh, yeah, kind of a bit of a gotcha. Uh, so yeah, what, once you have that, um, the typical uh, uh, contribution process is fork the repo, push a new branch to your, uh, your own repo with the modifications, create a pull request. When you do that pull request, things like, um, hey guys, uh, things like Travis CI unit tests and things will be run against your branch. Uh, it will complain if you don't add unit tests, but if you're not into unit testing or you don't have much experience, don't worry. Like somebody else can probably pick up the unit test component of that. Uh, it'll also run like PHP code sniffers for code formatting, and you can probably fix those up yourself if you see that it fails. I fail it on pretty much every code push I do. So it uh, turns out I thought I knew the WordPress coding standards, and I uh, guess I don't. Um, and it'll also run code coverage for, you know, measure how much of your uh, code is covered by unit tests. So we've got a pretty good system around most of that kind of stuff. Uh, so onto the plugin. Uh, I give a kind of quick run through of the files involved that you're probably interested in. So main file, plugin.php, everybody probably kind of knows the idea there. Uh, this is like the bootstrapping file. Includes all of our stuff and a lot of the just like outside of the um, hierarchy, key, uh, hierarchy of the infrastructure, it's just got a lot of few top level things. Uh, so general functions and, and things like that. So I'm not gonna kind of bother running through each one individually or that kind of stuff. Uh, one thing that probably is worth mentioning here is we have a compatibility v1 PHP. So everybody that built stuff with version one of the API, like built custom stuff on top of that, we, there's a compatibility shim, so that just works with v2. So v1 will by some point be replaced by v2 with the compatibility shim, or just the compatibility shim if it goes into core. Uh, the compatibility layer is actually pretty sketchy right now, so that is one area that needs to work is the V1 to V2. So if anybody's using V1 extensively and wants to update to V2 or whatever, there's work to be done there. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll jump over to the uh, server class. Um, so the kind of heart of the request comes into WordPress. There's a rewrite rule for slash WP JSON that essentially gets routed into the server and then it's determined which endpoint. So you don't have a WordPress rewrite rule per endpoint. All of the routing for specific rewrite, uh, specific endpoints is done in the server itself. 
so yeah, um, not that that's probably really going to affect you in most cases. So the server uh, kind of takes a uh, request and works out what endpoint it's going to be routed to and handles calling the, the, the route. Uh, so one interesting part is the authentication. So all of the authentication in the Delphi API is completely, pretty much all of the uh, authentication layers are separate plugins, and that's how it's probably going to continue to be. So it's very easy to hook in. Uh, you just hook into REST authentication errors, and you can uh, modify that to set the current user based off whatever authentication layer you're doing. So if you're doing some other weird integration with whatever system that you want, uh, then you hook in here, and that's how you kind of achieve that. And that's how uh, I think the basic auth and the auth form plugins achieve it. Um, let's see what else. So, so the kind of the main component here is serve request. So, request comes into the server and pretty much uh, calls serve request. So, what that does is uh, you know checks a lot of the super globals to kind of work out where it's, it's going to go and, and things like that. So one thing we do support is JSONP across the board. So uh, anybody can make just normal JavaScript calls without uh, you know, uh, calls or whatever to make JSONP requests from any JavaScript anywhere. Um, let's see, what else do we have? So uh, as well as the server, the server is a single instance. There's a global WP REST server variable where the server lives. You can, if you want, also filter that to use a different class. So people that want to do really crazy things can use a totally different server class. Uh, for example, there's the idea that the WP CLI tool would actually just be a thin layer on top of the REST API. So essentially, when you're writing CLI commands on the command line, it could route those to the endpoints. And so when you do WP post list, that actually gets routed as if you were to do an HTTP HTTP request to slash posts. Uh, so how you would probably achieve that is you would, you would replace the server instance with a CLI server instance. And that would allow you to, instead of doing HTTP stuff, do CLI level stuff. So that being said, there's a global version of the server. Uh, so the kind of other objects that are involved here, we have a WP REST request. So this is every request that comes in is presented in the form of a REST request object. Uh, so that includes things like the, uh, all of the variables for that request. And uh, eventually, you'll see what um, it also includes what endpoint that request is being routed to and, and things like that. Uh, so basically, what's happening here is we just push the super global get post files server all in to the REST request. And that does a lot of parsing and stuff to uh, kind of mix those all together. Basically, internally, the API doesn't really care where the data came from. Whether it's get, post, or files, it's all pushed into a single array, essentially. Uh, so you can, in a lot of cases, you know, the, the, the fact that it came from post or get doesn't really matter. You know, all of the data is relatively unsafe because it's just posted from elsewhere. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how that works. Um, the method, obviously, you can also override in the API by uh, specifying underscore method. If you're on like networks that don't support things like options requests and things like that, uh, then being able to specify that is, is handy. So that's how we do that. Uh, pretty much everything in the REST API uses WP error to uh, indicate errors up the stack. So uh, any callbacks or anything returning a WP error will probably propagate to give you a proper error code in the REST response and things like that. So. Uh, there's a lot of use of, of WP errors throughout. Um, so the, es essentially the request comes in to the server, calls serve request. Serve request sets up a lot of super globals and, and everything like that. Then it basically goes down to uh, dispatch. So um, if we jump to that function, uh, oh, Jesus, <laughs> here we go, uh, dispatch. So dispatch takes a request object and works out what endpoint it's going to be routed to, to dispatch it to that route. That's basically what it's doing. So the request here is the instance of WP request, uh, REST request, which was created higher up. Uh, but if you don't want to, let's say you want to do some kind of internal routing or something, and you want to make use of the API, but you don't want to, uh, it's not all of your data isn't in super globals. You can load up a REST request with all of the data you want and pass it to dispatch. 
and then dispatch will send it to the route you want. So you can do a lot of custom routing stuff that way. Uh, so essentially what we're doing here is getting all the registered routes on the class and then, you know, preg matching a little bit like, you know, most of the WordPress routing handles. Once it gets a match, then uh, it kind of rolls with it. So this code is written to be as performant as we can, which is kind of why it is structured as it is. So like, you know, I don't know, checking as much stuff as we can to skip it because this runs on every single request for the API, so it's kind of um, you know, important that it's not doing too much crazy stuff. Uh, so basically, uh, some point along here, here we go, so we've got a match. Uh, we check that there's a callable for it. This is for the, for the root now. Uh, at this point, we, so on the request object, because now we know the root, we pass in what the handler is, so this, this is a variable for the root. Uh, and then it kind of bootstraps a bunch of other stuff. I don't want to go into a great amount of detail here. Um, so at this point, we have the match root and everything, but before we actually call the root, we check uh, permissions that you have access to this root. So the, the permissions for a root is abstracted at a higher level, so we can check that you have access to actually call post on slash posts, because the callback for that is at a higher level than the, the root callback. Uh, so it means you're hopefully don't, uh, you, you when you're implementing code to do a root, then you already know that you're in a safe place where authentication has already been checked and all those kind of things. Uh, so we kind of do a bunch of checking stuff there. Um, and yeah, there we go. That kind of like gets the response from your root and then we'll send it up the stack so the server can have it and then it'll send it up, you know, sends it to the browser kind of thing. Uh, so that's pretty much the uh, server component. Uh, I'm going to jump over to uh, WP REST request request quickly, Oop. hoping it's something like that, there we go. Uh, so the REST request, this is the previous class I explained that uh, all of the data goes into here and uh, that is passed to your controller. So the uh, main thing you need to know about this is it implements array access. So when your controller uh, is called to say, you know, your, your callback that's going to output all the data for, for whatever endpoint. Uh, the, you can access all of the data that's been passed in by array access rather than um, you know, having to interact with the object as if it was an object. You can just use array access for anybody. You, know, you kind of go like this, request ID, um, and it's going to go through the array access and work out exactly what variable that's being pulled from. Uh, so this includes like the headers that came in request, all of the data, that kind of stuff. I don't think uh, I kind of need to run through a lot more there. Uh, so we have REST request, that's about everything coming in. Then we have REST response, that's about everything you're sending out from your controller. So I'm going to jump over to REST response quickly. Uh, so this is um, expend, extends to the HTTP response because it's pretty similar with a couple of extra things to whatever your REST response is. So one thing uh, that kind of includes is linking. So the API has this concept of uh, things can link to other things because uh, like a comment can link to the post that it is in. Uh, so there's all these relations everywhere and allowing clients that are using the API to follow those relations is, is pretty handy. So if I were to go here, uh, in fact I may, uh, as my internet isn't working, I'll have to kind of just uh, go through this. But all of these links in here are added automatically by, via the linking here. So um, if I scroll down to uh, slash posts or something like that. So ev every route has a link to itself. Uh, so this is how we like do, do all the exploring. I think because, uh, yeah. If, if, if I were to do a request to slash pages, you would be able to see Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that because I don't have internet and my local environment is screwed right now. So. Huh? Do you want the password for Wi-Fi? Um, no. I don't, I, don't, I, I don't need to go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> but the basic idea is the linking is abstracted, so uh, the clients can do stuff with it, and you don't need to kind of do all that manually in your own controller classes. Oh, whoa, something weird just happened. Oh shit, did I run a, oh no, no, it's back here. I'm back, I think I pulled out the cord. Is that all right if I get some power there? Cool. Um, good catch, yeah, is that, what, what is that even on? I don't know, it doesn't even display on this projector. Um, 
yeah, so, so that is the links. I don't think we need to really go for anything here. The only thing probably worth bearing in mind is um, you can have a REST response, and if it's got any kind of error code, it's kind of handy to know was this REST response like successful or not at the PHP level. So that's what this is error is, which uh, we'll just check if it's more than or equal to 400, which if we've done our logic right, should mean that that indicates any kind of error response. And you can also grab a WP error object from that. So you can have it basically have the REST response that is an error be converted to a WP error. So again, if you're doing uh, like internal routing and things like that, and maybe you want to handle WP errors internally, then, then you can do that. Um, OK, cool. Let's move on to uh, something a little more interesting. I'm going to pull up a sidebar quickly so we can kind of, you can get an idea for the hierarchy of where this kind of stuff fits in. So I think, uh, let's get rid of the test folder. So this is the whole plugin, you can see here. So uh, plugin.php, like I mentioned. So the two things I've gone through is infrastructure. Um, so these really don't really have very much, you don't need to worry about them. So there's the server, the request, and the response. That's pretty much the whole API that, I, that I've just, you know, very quickly run through. That is all of the uh, business logic around how things get rude and everything. Everything else is now just built on top of the API in the same way that any custom endpoints will be built on top of the API. Uh, so the, I think we've got like um, a couple of thousand lines is in the infrastructure side of things, um, so it's pretty lightweight. Uh, the majority of the code is actually in the endpoints, which is kind of all the WordPress data that we love and know uh, about that. So one of the big motivations on v2 was about extensibility and I kind of the way I look at it now is we've really built an API to build APIs um, and, and that is you know the, all of the WordPress objects here are using the, the uh, PHP API to, to create those so it's all kind of as you can probably see by the naming all kind of follows this idea of its class WP rest something controller so the idea is there is a single controller pretty much for each object type within WordPress and they all inherit from the same controller. So if I do this, uh, so abstract class WP REST controller, and this um, is gonna be kind of where you put everything per root. So if there's any ever bugs or anything like that in any of our specific endpoints, just go find the controller for that object type and you're gonna find it in, some, in, in there somewhere. Uh, so the idea is you extend this class and you implement as many of these methods as you want. The main thing to bear in mind is you don't need to implement them all. If you have an endpoint that only allows you to read a post type uh, or whatever of a custom data type, you don't need to worry about all of the methods around updating and things like that. So primarily we have one for register routes. So what do you do inside register routes? This is where you need to set up all the routes for your object types. So if we were to look in like, um, what's a simple one? Um, Let's have a look in post statuses, maybe, controller. So this registers three routes. Uh, for anybody that isn't familiar with, I'm presuming most people aren't just like the general REST API code anyway, register REST root is like the main function. Think of it like, it's a bit like register post type or something like that, but just for routes. So here we are registering uh, WP slash V2 as a namespace and slash statuses. So this is the route that lets you get all available post statuses on the site. Uh, so we have three of them in total. Status, the status slash schema, which will output you uh, like just a JSON blob to tell you a bit of data about actually what the, um, what the data is. I'll run to the schemas after. So essentially it's got statuses and then status slash the single status uh, to, to give you the, the one there. And we all follow the same convention of the slash plural to list items is pretty much always a get items callback. So like listing lots is get items, listing one is get item. Uh, updating one is update item, creating one is create item, delete one is delete item. Uh, so the, it's not actually enforced that you have to use those. This is just kind of a construct that you can use and pattern that you can follow. The, all of the infrastructure stuff is totally unaware of any abstraction at the REST controller level. So if you are doing crazy things with the API where you want to do non really like restful resource based stuff or you want to do like weird real time things or you want like, I don't know, whatever the weird, um, you know, random endpoints that you want to do, you might not want to use this high level abstraction for rest controller that's geared around 
uh, creating, updating, and deleting objects. Uh, so the, the infrastructure stuff isn't aware of the high level abstraction, so there's, there's no hard link between them, and that actually that, that creates like a pretty good separation of concerns for wh where different things lie. So uh, th this is the uh, says this one, like I mentioned. So get items, this is the request that is passed in by the server, WPRS request. So here we get to do a bunch of stuff, and then we return the data that we want the, data, the endpoint to return. That's the general idea. You receive a request in your callback, and then you return any data. That'll automatically be converted to JSON, and you can, uh, you know, you can return a WP error. That'll automatically return to a proper error, and, all that, and the error data will be output in JSON, that kind of stuff. Uh, so jumping back over just to the template one. So we have in the template, we've just like uh, templated out all of the um, methods that you can implement that kind of make sense to implement. Uh, so you've got get items, get item, create item, yada, yada. So now what we've got, get items, permissions, check. And there's one of these for every other one. So what we've tried to do in the API is abstract out the permissions level of stuff with the uh, like logic of your callback and what it is doing. Rather than having convoluted logic in a procedural way, we pull out the permissions check separately. There's a couple of reasons we do that. One is uh, it kind of allows you to split the code out quite nicely. The other functional use is you can send an options request to any root in, Word, in the WordPress API, and it will return the allowed headers of what you're allowed to do. And the way that we're able to do that is we only call the permissions check per root on those different item types, and that allows us to say, if you do an options request to slash post unauthenticated, it will return you a loud header of uh, only get. If you are authenticated as, say, an administrator, it'll return you get um, whatever, you know, delete uh, post uh, put or whatever. Uh, so yeah, that, that's why we have the permission stuff abstracted out at a different level. Um, and I think the statuses one doesn't have a, an example because it doesn't have any updating routes. There are no permissions on this status level stuff. Uh, if we instead look at uh, WP terms controller or something like that, uh, in, oh, that, I always do this, which is open the uh, test unit tests rather than the uh, actual file. So how does that actually happen? So all the permissions check, we have a callback for get items, and then there's a permission callback where you pass get items permission check. So like I said, that get items or get items permission check isn't a hard-coded thing that you have to work towards because you can actually specify whatever you want in register routes. It's just a pattern that we're using throughout and that you might as well continue using. But I don't need to use that. I could switch that out, and I could switch that for uh, is user logged in. Now that endpoint is just only going to be available to logged in users. So it's just a, it's, it's an arbitrary callback to use in whatever way you want. We just use the, this pattern because we're usually doing a lot more complicated checks than one function callback. In general, though, don't do is user logged in. You want to check for capabilities and authorization rather than logged in. Yeah, obviously, uh, depends what you're doing. Like some endpoints, maybe your site has open registration and maybe sl like getting uh, users slash me, maybe that is uh, permission check of is user logged in because you, like that's always available to a logged in user. Maybe you do it then. Uh, but yeah, don't, don't use the fact that they're logged in typically to mean that they can do anything clever because they might be logged in as a user with no permission to do anything whatsoever. Let's jump back over here. Uh, where were we? There we go. Uh, so we have the permissions checks. They kind of go hand in hand with all the different callbacks there. Uh, then what do we have? Prepare item for database and prepare item for response. So again, we're abstracting. When you have a WordPress post and it's formatted like a WordPress post, which is a PHP object that has like post underscore status, post underscore title, post uh, content. Those are not the field names in the response of the JSON request. The, the field names in the JSON request is standardized across all of the different object types. So it's always a uh, title for terms, even though in WordPress, a term actually has a name, not a title. Uh, so prepare item for response is, is what is doing that. Take me a WordPress post and return it this big normal standardized array. So again, if you're doing customized endpoints, that is, you could subclass the uh, WP post rest controller, but you want to return totally different data. 
So you could just overwrite this method, and then you would just be able to change, change the structure of, of that data there. Uh, prepare writing for database is a little less used. It's basically called in the create and update methods uh, to standardize the kind of take this request. Again, you, we have to convert the uh, kind of much more standard, nice JSON REST API names back into WordPress um, arguments for things like WP insert post and, and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of what, what that is for. Uh, prepare response for collection. So collections, uh, though changing at some point, are a little, a collection isn't quite just a list of objects. It also has uh, like the total amount that that collection has and the kind of pagination side of things. So a, a collection is actually more than just a group of items. There's metadata about them as well. So I can't kind of think off the top of my head now exactly the specifics of this, but basically, we have a collection. Did we put the stuff in yet about rearranging the collection object we response? OK, right. Collection is going to be, you're going to get a JSON blob back that has like a data item and all of your stuff in there. And then it has like underscore links and links to do the collection rather than that. Because if you have an array being the top level, you can never attach that uh, metadata to the array or anything. Um, OK, we also have this thing called context. So it's uh, you know an incredibly arbitrary term, <laughs> but what we're using it for uh, is you can send a request to the API and say what is the context this request is for. So you can say the request is for uh, viewing it, or you could say the request is for updating it. Uh, so depending on those things may change the data that you get back. So if you were to get a user object and you're only wanting to view it, then we don't return things like the user email field. Uh, because users who have permission to view a user can't view their email, but they can view the kind of basic details there. So the, the context of edit means I'm getting this object to edit it. That means you need to be able to edit that object. You need permissions to do that. And then it'll return you all the data to do with it so you can change any field you want and push all of that data back. That's the kind of basic idea around contexts. Uh, I won't kind of go into the nitty gritty of, of, of what those functions are doing. So schema, uh, this is kind of the last component. Um, what this is really trying to do is provide documentation to clients on what objects, what the shape of an object is, uh, and what the different fields kind of mean. So the schema for a post object would be something like the type is post, the you know, uh, description is a WordPress post object. There's a properties value, which is an array of properties. One is ID, which the descript type is numeric. Like, it's just this big JSON array. JSON, uh, what's the standard that we're using? JSON schema. JSON schema is the standard. So it's just a standard way to, to, to represent what an object should look like. The idea being that a client could then use that to provide some client-side validation. So when somebody sets a post author to be string Joe, it'll be able to throw an error and say, no, post author is meant to be an integer, not a string or something like that. So it's providing quite a lot more metadata around that. Now, internally, we also use those schemas for quite a lot of other things. Uh, when you uh, want to get, uh, when, when we want to test all of the arguments that are coming in for a specific object, so let's say you're going to update a post. We need to check you know, all of the different values that it's being sent in and whether they're all valid and everything. Or what if values are even available? Like what are all of the parameters that are available? We just interpret the schema to infer all of that data. Uh, so you only have to write your schema for your object and then you get a lot of stuff for free by having that. Like the client will be able to ask for what is the schema, know what all of the data that it should send. And when they send that data, the uh, API will also validate it based off of the schema and throw back any initial errors that it can do. So if you've passed in uh, a string somewhere that is marked up as an integer in your schema, it'll automatically throw an error back. Uh, that you sh probably, in a lot of cases, should do more validation in your own callbacks to make sure of other things. Uh, but you, know, you can say the format is a URI, and it will check that. You can say the format is date time, and if somebody doesn't pass a valid date time, it'll automatically validate that for you. So there's a lot of, of, of that kind of stuff. So if we were to look in, uh, maybe let's look in the terms controller again, because it's, it's not too complex. The, uh, ooh, wrong one. 
it. I, so the get item schema here, like I mentioned, it kind of looks like this. There's an ID property. It's marked up as read only. So that means that a client shouldn't be expected to send that value back. It's just something about it, like a GUID or something, again, is, is read only. Like the link, which is the URL to the object, again, that's, that's read only. Name is not. Uh, so yeah, we're kind of marking it all, all, all up that way. Uh, one other really nice things we do have is enum. Uh, if anybody doesn't know, enum is the value of allow, uh, the, the, the list of allowed values for that. So again, by specifying these in the schema, the API will automatically do the validation for those. So if anybody pass something that isn't one of get taxonomies, then it's automatically throw an error and it will tell the client, uh, whatever you passed is not one of, and then we'll display them the enum so they know which one to select as well. Uh, so that's the same for things like post statuses and other things that, that we try and, try and do like that. Uh, so like the schema where, because we get to build the schema dynamically, uh, the terms controller is used for any taxonomy. And the taxonomy could be hierarchical or it might not be hierarchical. Uh, so you initiate the controller and you pass it a taxonomy. So when you call get item schema, then it will only include the parent in the schema if it's for a taxonomy that is hierarchical. Uh, so you, know, you, you can do quite a lot of um, kind of clever stuff there based off that. Uh, so, last but not least, I think, uh, additional fields. So, we have this, uh, you know, you can subclass or you can create your own custom classes to create complex things. What happens if you're a plugin like WordPress SEO and you just want to add a simple field to all posts, like a uh, focus keyword, I think they have or something? Like, let's say you want to include that in all post responses. There's a simpler API for that called currently called register API field, that basically you say register API field, the first parameter is the object type, like post, the second is the field name, like focus keyword, the next, and then you pass it an array of options. The options are like, what is the get callback? That's to say, what should the data be on the get request than an update callback? And I think that's actually what you have. Uh, so the idea is that you can tack on extra fields to all of the objects here pretty easily, uh, rather than having to do um, filtering. The reason we don't do filtering is because we don't really want to encourage people to ever remove any fields from response objects. If you were to just go randomly remove a field from response object when a client is expecting that WP slash posts has a post underscore content field, there are plenty of languages where it makes it a little more difficult to actually, like, you're going to run into some uh, like runtime exception or something like that when you're trying to access values that don't exist. So typically, add stuff is OK to objects. Removing stuff is bad. And the kind of API that we've got for that is kind of reflects that. Um, the other reason we don't use filters is there's quite a few that you would need to do, because uh, you also get to pass a schema for your specific object, uh, specific field that you're adding. Uh, so like if it was filters, you'd probably need four or five filters to do all this stuff. For anybody that's worked with rewrite rules, you typically need like three filters per rewrite rule. So, this is just one register API field, and you pass it the bunch of stuff, and it kind of all gets hooked in that way. Uh, the, the advantage of, of doing it that way as well is if somebody pulls the schema for any object type, it'll automatically include the schema for all of the extra fields that have been registered as well. So the client can automatically, if they wanted, they could automatically add UI for extra fields that have been registered as well, um, the, the, the basic idea. Uh, okay, I lied, we do have one more. Uh, get collection params, that's basically just an, an abstraction for, uh, if you think of uh, slash posts, there's a bunch of parameters to filter posts that we need to tell people about. Uh, so the, you know, you can specify the post date or the post status if you have access to read different post statuses and all that kind of stuff. Now, the reason we pull this out into a separate get collections param Params is because uh, when somebody sends an options request to an endpoint, they'll be able to know what query parameters are available for this uh, route to, to provide extra filtering on them. Um, so maybe let's just have a quick look at uh, WP Post Controller. This is probably the most complex controller we have. So uh, the controller is passed a post type in construct here. So then register roots, uh, what, that, that gets a little more tricky. So post type base, for example. Uh, finding the base for a post type. So WP, 
WP slash V2 slash and then the post type base uh, can be different because maybe you register a custom post type and maybe you call it, I don't know, what, whatever you want to call it, but maybe you want it to be represented differently in the API's root. So when you call a register post type, you can pass in rest base as a, as a parameter to that and it will uh, you know, respect that in automatically. Uh, if you specify the REST base, it'll automatically be included in the REST API and everything that I've shown you will function. So we have like custom post types working from the get-go, but your custom post type will have the same schema as uh, WordPress posts. So if you have a custom post type that has loads of extra fields, you're probably gonna want a subclass and kind of roll your own there. Uh, so when you do that, uh, you can call register post type and you can pass in rest controller and your own controller class and that class will automatically get used rather, rather than the uh, rest controller I'm showing here. Uh, so once we've got the base, then we kind of register the stuff we want. So we register get items and create item on slash base. Uh, then we have uh, get item on slash the ID. Uh, and editable again on slash the ID and delete on slash the ID and then the schema. Uh, where things get a little hairy on this is the generating the schema for a post is kind of hairy because uh, all post types can have quite different schemas. So this is actually used for pages and posts and take the menus for example. We don't have menus at the moment. When we do, it probably wouldn't use the post controller because menus are so different, though technically they're a post type. Uh, the, the data structure is, is so different that we probably just, just wouldn't use that. Uh, so we add the properties date, date GMT, GUID, yada yada. These are always added. Um, but then we check for does the post type support all of these things and depending whether it does affects the schema. So if you uh, don't register post type support post content, then post content won't be added to the schema for your object. Uh, and we do the same for all of the different supports for post types. Uh, so you, you can like change the data structure of your custom post type pretty well without having to subclass this and do everything. Um, but you know, if, if you're gonna be doing a lot of custom stuff, I'd subclass if, if you're just doing bits and bobs here, like you don't have thumbnails, then don't worry, that's not gonna be included in the schema. Uh, so like attachments only have title, author, comments, and revisions. Uh, uh, yeah, so as you can see, that kind of makes the get item schema in the post controller fairly more complex be because of that. Uh, but yeah, this is um, fun code. Uh, page templates is also an enum, which is pretty cool because we have a list of determined page templates then you can pass the enum to the client and then they can have a little drop down so they can you know, select what page template you might want. Uh, the kind of, one of the golden standards we try work towards is like imagine if the WordPress, a, uh, the WordPress admin were powered by the API, what data would it need access to in order to provide that admin? So it would need things like the page templates and, and things like that. Um, Okay, uh, what else, what else? Let's have a quick refer back to my sidebar to see if I've kind of skipped over anything. Um, maybe I'll quickly uh, run through how testing works. Uh, so pretty much every controller has a test counterpart to it that tests all the stuff in the controller. What time are we on? Does anyone have the time, by the way? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so... There, there are a lot of other ones like, you know, testing the server, testing request, but for the most part, the bulk of our tests are in the uh, component class to, to the controller. So if we look in maybe a, a, a simple one to begin with, like comments controller. Uh, so we extend WP test rest test case. Uh, and in here, you know, we usually create all the data that we're gonna be worrying about for, for this specific type. Uh, pretty much all of them um, get the roots from the server and just verify that those roots exist. This is, this is all PHP unit now. Um, yeah, there's nothing functional in here. It's all just about verifying stuff. Uh, so yeah, we, we're just verifying all the roots are there. Then there's pretty much a, at least one method for test get items, test get item, test update item, all of that stuff. There's pretty much always uh, you know, additions on those. So we make sure test items work pretty much always check permissions on things. Um, that you can't get them if you don't have permission is a pretty standard pattern. So we unset the current user, we try and get slash comments, 
And why the hell can't you get, con oh, because we're using context edit. So if you're saying get comments to edit them, we're going to say you're not allowed to do that because you don't have the ability to get comments to edit. So an edit, uh, to, to give you an idea why that is, a comment in context edit is going to give you stuff like the email address of the user who made the comment. So again, like in the WordPress admin example, you would want a comments editing interface that would want to give you access to change all of the comment data. But you don't necessarily need to give that data to a front end that is displaying comments. Uh, so that's, that's the need for context, really. Um, so there's just you know you, your usual shitloads of copy paste and shit like that that PHP unit tests typically have. You know we don't really, I'm not really a fan of like complex abstracted unit tests with helper methods and everything. I find like procedural code in unit tests is definitely the easiest way to go. Uh, so just keep it as simple as possible. You know only check for what you're actually trying to prove, not a load of other stuff as well. Um, let's see, yeah, some of them get, get a little more complicated, as you can see. Uh, so maybe I'll quickly, um, so I have here, this is a Vagrant box with WP API in it. Um, I'm actually like inside the WP API uh, plugin repo. So if you actually want to, I think the quickest way to do this is to um, run, oops. Yeah. So you can just run the, uh, install bin in the plugin here, um, and you pass it a couple of things, it'll tell you to pass those if you didn't do. Uh, what I'll do is download a copy of uh, the WordPress testing library of WordPress test, put it in your temp directory and everything, uh, so, and so you can run the unit tests. Um, I think to actually run the tests, you don't really need to do anything else. If you want to run code sniff and things, you have to run like composer install and grunt and whatever the hell else, but um, yeah. So if I run PHP unit correctly, uh, aside the fact that I like need to install this PHP extension that I don't have, um, uh, I think because I don't have internet, I've probably got something else on this install that is trying to access the internet right now, which is why this isn't working. But the unit tests, I think, uh, how many do we have? Like a few hundred? So uh, I don't know, but we have about 86 or 87 percent coverage. Okay, yeah, so we've got, Pretty good coverage, testing's pretty important, like, uh, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, it's pretty quick to run them. I think, like, I'm running on this on a pretty loaded up database. If you've got an empty database, it's like 30 seconds to run through them all. Uh, 350, there we go. So we take testing fairly seriously, because this is candidate for core. Uh, the basic idea is hopefully the better testing we have, the more likelihood it has of being taken seriously. Um, is, is the basic idea. A uh, couple of tips for you. running unit tests, you can do dash dash filter and you can basically put anything in here. So I could just type test prepare item or if I only want to run this one, then I can just do that and then I'll only run those tests, uh, apart from the fact that it's slow as hell right now. Um, you can also do stop on error and stop on failure. So as soon as it gets to a test that breaks, it's going to exit and tell you what's broken. Otherwise, you know, you have to run the whole suite and then you have to wait till it's finished even though you saw that one failed at the beginning, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty much, uh, pretty much kind of a very fast run through of pretty much all the code we have. Uh, I'm sure it probably isn't incredibly clear the path that everything is taken to get to these points. I think to get to that point, you're probably going to dig through it yourselves. Um, to, to, to completely have an idea of that. But the, the basic idea is things come into a server, they create a, re uh, a request object, they pass it into the controller, the controller returns data, which is turned into a response object that's sent to the client. Um, that's basically the, the, the flow. Uh, and the, all of the, pretty much all of the hard stuff is actually in uh, all of these controllers because WordPress underneath is a total then um, like there's a lot of work that goes into standardizing everything like there's a lot of weird quirks in WordPress where like post password stuff for instance is a total hack right now um, like normalizing all those fields again like trying to represent it as if as if WordPress had a, as a, a decent schema underneath we don't really want people to feel like they're just you know talking to a WordPress database via the API that's totally not the idea it's, it's more for, 
I think you know, opening WordPress up to be able to work with people that don't know WordPress. So, yeah. um, any questions about any of that? <laughs> right, cool. Okay, well, um, yeah, I guess I'll just finish up by saying, like, there is uh, a lot of, um, lot of room for people to help out. Just, you know, there's only really, like, four of us working on it, like, you know, week to week. There's a few others helping out bits and bobs. Um, yeah, so, so there's, like, plenty of help needed. Feedback on generally anything is, uh, uh, you know, really wanted, like design decisions that we've made, things that aren't obvious, um, things that, you know, seem dubious or whatever, um, any small improvements. I, like, happened to open a file yesterday and just looked through and found some lines that I could delete because they weren't really doing anything. Like, I'm sure there are other things like that that exist. So the more eyes, the better is our kind of uh, idea. Yeah. Cool. All right. Wow. Thanks, thanks for listening. Right. And uh, I guess for the rest of the time, I don't know if we've, we had a table in the big room, um, which I guess we can go to. I'm guessing everybody here is going to write writing code. But I think for the next hour or two, anyway, I'm going to be around hacking on it. So uh, yeah, anybody wants help getting set up or uh, advice on anything, questions, just let me know. Cool. Cheers. <laughs>